Welcome to Sarah Talks Food. Today, I get to share with you my conversation with Mark Hatfield. And if you live in Ottawa, you might know Mark as a local firefighter. You might have seen his name in lights at Yuck Yucks. He's now a uh, stand-up comic. You also might have heard him speak. He does lots of motivational talk for both youth and adults alike. He held the Olympic torch. He was also an NFL player for the Miami Dolphins. Well, a former professional football player urged St. Peter's High School students today to reach for their dreams and to aspire to be the best they can be. Ten years to the day that my brother passed, ten years to the day that I made that promise, the dream came true. I met Dan Marino. I signed my first contract in the NFL. Because hi, Mark. I'm Dan Marino. Welcome to the Miami Dolphins. I did it! Yes! I did it that day! I hope that you really enjoy this conversation and get inspired that you know what life isn't always going to be perfect but we can absolutely take the steps to do the best that we can to achieve the goals that we want to create a great life and to just be better people along the way so i hope you enjoy this conversation with mark hatfield welcome i'm just so glad to have this conversation with you i've been following your story a fair bit over the last uh, while and i've been so inspired by you by the fact that you were a guy with a dream early on, and then you um, went ahead and just created all of these different opportunities in your life from you know, being an NFL football player, and we're gonna talk about that, all the way to becoming a firefighter, and now a motivational speaker and a fitness trainer. So I wanna kind of dig into your story a little bit and talk about how you got started on your path. I did all that. You That's did all crazy. that. Oh my goodness. I should write this stuff down. Uh, my path started a long time ago, as I'm very old now. Uh, the story I tell starts January 22nd, 1985, when my big brother Bill and I were watching uh, the Super Bowl on TV. And he was a big fan of the Miami Dolphins. So he said, uh, Mark, you got to watch this Dan Marino guy. He's only in his second season in the NFL and he's making the break in all kinds of records. And so, you know, as the little brother, I'm like, all right, Bill, let's watch. And, you know, we're watching the game. Halfway through the game, he turns to me and says, you know what, Mark, Dan Marino can do this at such a young, early age. Why can't, you know, you at least play in the NFL? So that's where the journey and the goal and the dream of playing in the NFL started. Sort of like just crazy dream between, uh, between brothers. And we, you know, I'm like, all right, Bill, I'd only played one year of organized football at Gloucester High School in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, it didn't go so well. So I turned to my big brother for help and he was like, well, I got an idea. Let's go out and practice. So he, him and I, after school, you know, four or five times a week, would go down to the local sports field and play catch and do sprints and push ups and stuff like that. And we did that all off season, all winter long. It just became what we did. And the next season started and all that hard work had paid off. So we uh, we, we uh, went to uh, the playoffs that year at Gloucester High School and my brother was like oh the playoffs are a big game you know you're gonna you're gonna have a, a big game so it was uh, October 30th 1985 my first big game here's my chance to show my teammates myself and my big brother that you know that I could do this and help the team win the game and that someday I could make it to the NFL and uh, as the game went on you know we were scoring they were scoring and it was just this emotional craziness for a young young kid and then at the end of the game we ended up losing which is a horrible feeling for a young person. After the game, I walk back into the change room and uh, you know my head is spinning and I put everything I had into this. And as I go into the change room, somebody yells at me and they're like, Mark, you have to go back outside. Your uncle's out there and uh, he needs to talk to you. And it was weird because I hadn't seen my uncle in you know a long time. And he never came to any of my sports stuff. So I walk out in the hallway and my uncle's there and he walks over to me and he's, you know, doesn't look, him's not right, his eyes are all red. And, takes me by the arm and he's like, Mark, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your big brother Bill died today. See, my brother was born with a hole in his heart. And from a, a very young age, my brother had been told that any day could be his last day. And he, he took every day and he lived it like it might be his last. And that's sort of where I got my, my joie de vivre, my, my reason to, to keep going like that. And the promise on that day, I had a decision to make as a, as a 15 year old, that the dream that we had made together the goal we had set together make it the NFL I could either just quit right then and there or I could just never stop trying and that's what I decided to do I decided to make the, the legacy of my big brother's life of me never giving up on that dream that goal instead of just me giving up on it right so so I never try I never stopped trying I would take myself out to that sports field and the rain the dark the cold and I would you know do push-ups and sprints and run with the football and every year you know high school football I got a little bit better 
And by my last season at Gloucester High School, when other guys in the team were getting scholarship offers and letters from university, you know, every day I'd run home and check my mailbox for one of those letters and I never got one. But I'd made that promise, right? That was what fueled me every single day. And so I went back to high school another year, grade 14, they call it, right? You know, or grade 15, I, I kept going. <laughs> and I just kept trying. And at the end of that year, my last year, officially of high school, I got one letter from uh, the smallest football playing school in Canada, Bishop's University. Great school, but nobody from that school had ever gone on to play in the NFL. But it was my only chance, and my only hope. So I went there and, I, and my, my plan there was to impress everybody so much that every year I won this, you know, an all-star award. And by the end of my four year career, everyone's gonna you know, have heard of me and invite me to the NFL training camp. And so that was my plan in my head. And uh, didn't go as plans. In my first year, I broke my ankle, cut the tip off my finger, never played a game. I know, crazy. <laughs> Second year, I, I got moved from receiver to defense to offense, didn't go well. Third year, I broke my hand in training camp, played the whole year with one hand. Fourth year, no luck. I had to go back a fifth year. And finally, through never giving up, uh, I got an all-star award and I figured that was the key. That's what's going to, you know, get the NFL to knock on my door. And they didn't care about that either. And so I got drafted in the first round of the CFL draft, which was great and fantastic. And based on that, I had to contact the sports agent who then started shopping me around. I got invited to training camp uh, with the Detroit Lions, which was super exciting. But uh, I got cut there. And then three days later after getting cut, you know, I was home in Ottawa living on my mom's couch. And I got a, a phone call from the Miami Dolphins. And they're inviting me down to try out for their team. They've been watching me. They like what they see. So I head down there. And the day I do my workout is October 30th, 1995. It was 10 years to the day that my big brother Bill had, had passed away. It was 10 years to the day that I'd made that promise. So, I mean, what I teach young people, old people, first of all, that's a crazy fact. And you can take that and decide what that means to you. But what I will say is it's 10 years. It was 10 years of failure, 10 years of people telling me I couldn't do it. 10 years of waking up every single day and finding it from within myself, but how I was gonna continue and how I was gonna chase that dream. I did the workout and head coach Don Chula says, thanks Mark, why don't you go wait inside? And as I'm sitting there waiting for someone to come and talk to me, trying to catch my breath, the door opens up the other side of the room and this familiar looking guy walks and he walks right straight over to me it's crazy. And he says, hi, Mark, I'm Dan Marino. Congratulations, you made the team. So that, that day, through not giving up, through making a promise to my brother, my dreams came true. And, uh, you know, that's the message I go out and I teach people of all ages is that if there's something that you want, that you're passionate about, you go out there and you never give up on it. You find the steps that it takes to get there. You ask everybody, you tell everybody what you're doing and you just don't give up until, until it happens and it'll happen. I just love that story and I just love the tenacity and the relentlessness that you went after that goal. And I just imagine there's so many people that think, you know, if you, you know, you fail or you fall down or it doesn't work out, that we often just want to quit and move on to something else and just assume that, you know what, that just wasn't for us. What was it or was it your brother's message to you? Is that what kept you going all those 10 years when you were failing and things were breaking and you were hurting yourself and it wasn't working out? Is that what kept you going that whole time? Yeah, you know, I make it sound easy and like, oh, that one promise and it fueled me for 10 years. It was a lot of misery. It was a lot of things not going my way. A lot of reminding myself that I've made this promise. You know what? And when you, when you go and you do something and you make that like a promise that can never really be taken back. It really, like, I was faced with a roadblock, something that could have stopped me right then and there. It was a horrible thing. But instead of letting it affect me in that way, I tried to, you know, and without really realizing it, because I was a 15 year old kid, but I made it into a positive. I made it the reason why I was gonna get up every single day with a smile on my face and, and be goal oriented, task oriented, and attack this goal. There's lots of days where sure, things weren't going my way. And, and you have to remind yourself every single day it's something that I have to remind myself every day. I remind my children of every day. And that's what I do when I go into presentations is I remind people, this is life. It's not easy. There's going to be lots of reasons to stop. But if it's something that you're passionate about, something that you want real bad, then you just keep going. You figure out, you know, your mistakes are, are, are you know, they're clues about which direction to head, right? When you, when things don't go your well, the, your way, they're telling you which way to go. So, uh, you know, you just take every day and, 
and live it like it might be your last and, and head in that direction. Well, and I think you have such an experience of it really can be your last. I mean, losing your brother at 14 years old, I mean, that's just not something that people, that typically happens. So I imagine that you had this sense of it really can be your last day. And that is what has done so well for you with, you know, being able to inspire youth. And I see you going to lots of schools and really, you know, pumping them up and inspiring them. I'm wondering, do they have to, you know, do you help kids to figure out what their dream is? And do you have a strategy or some type of a, of a plan to help kids that might be feeling like, I don't even know what my dream is, or I don't even have a dream or think about having a dream. Is there something that you can help with? Because I know you talk a lot about smart goals and setting goals and, and going after things, but what about the kid that sort of says, I don't even know what I'm good at? Yeah, you get lots of that. You get lots of people you know, telling kids, oh, you don't have to figure out now what you want to do. But my message is figure out something that you love now, something that you're passionate about now, find out how to achieve that goal. And then all goals after that become easier, right? The more we do things, the better we get at it. So if you're any kind of goal, like a two week goal, I want to do well on this math test. So then we break it down and then we figure it out. If things go well, oh, all of a sudden I've learned goal setting and how that really works. Right, because after after setting this great giant goal where I dedicated you know ten years of my life to it, everything after that has become a little bit easier, you know. So it's actually discovering that it's a process. It's not the person. It's how you go about doing it. And once you discover that and practice it, then it's great. So I, I tell kids, you know, you don't have to have your long term goal right now. It's great if you do, and if you do, you know, figure that out too, and have lots of little goals on the way there too. So you know, find something that you want to do in the next three months and write it down and find out the steps that it takes. Ask everyone who's been there, done that, that's there to support you, coaches, teachers, parents, big brothers, and attack that goal and learn to, to set goals and achieve them. And it feels that's great. such great advice because I think that so often it's like uh, building a muscle. You know, when we start to get better and better at achieving goals, I know even in my own life, I don't think I achieved a lot of goals growing up as a kid. There weren't things that I was really proud of. But as I got older and I kind of went through, um, I got sober uh, 13 years ago. And from that point on, it was achieving after achieving after achieving goals. It was setting them and achieving them and saying, okay, well, if I did that, then let's try to do something else and kept moving from that energy. And I just think that's such great advice for young kids that might think, you know, well, I don't know if I want to be a football player, if I want to be a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor, but hey, I can save 20 bucks to go towards buying this thing that I want in the next two weeks or, you know, whatever it yeah. is, you know, just setting yeah. some kind of small goals. I really think that's great advice. Yeah, it's a lot of fun too, right? Like this, you know, this generation is all about games. And if you make it a game, it's fun too, right? It's I've seen my eight-year-old jump out of bed in the morning so he can go play on his iPad, right? So now if he's focused and goal setting on something else, he'll jump out of bed and he'll do that, whatever it takes to, to you know, ride the bike around the block or whatever his goal is. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> We have a long block. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So okay. let's kind of switch gears. Um, when you went from being an NFL player, so how long did you play in the NFL? Uh, two years in the NFL, three years in the CFL. Fantastic. And so I know that you um, that you suffered with a head injury. Yeah. And I also know that there was an ac a car accident. So I, are those the same story or are those two different incidents? No, the, my, uh, my head injury is what ended my career. I was playing in the CFL and I got a really bad concussion. And I decided then, you know, it's like if you hurt your knee and you can limp around for life, but if once you hurt your head, then, you know, that sort of frightened me. And I was actually unable to watch football for a few years after because of the, just the collisions and stuff going on. Whereas now I sort of, you know, far removed from it, I can realize the, the value of football and the, the whole great experience. In fact, one of my kids plays football now and football, just a little off topic, but has changed so much in the way that the, the, the it's coached that there's far less injuries and then when you do get injured they don't just throw you right back in so that's changed completely and uh, the car accident one was six years ago no I was uh, I'd had kids and I was uh, my first edit my oldest son who was eight at the time we were uh, heading to Kingston for his first out-of-town hockey tournament you know this great father-son bonding experience had waited you know my whole life for and we're driving and I can see the arena and I'm like all right we're almost there and as we go through the last intersection truck goes right through the red light smashes into the side of our van you know comes right up on top of me pins me down uh, starts pushing us sideways through traffic and all i could do is look back at my little boy and here we go from the greatest moment to like the worst moment of my life and then you know it all happened and there's smoke everywhere and car pieces and there's a guy running around our car all crazy and then i, I just heard my little my boy and he said uh 
Daddy, are we going to be late for hockey? And then when I realized he was all right, it sort of gave me this great perspective on life about how, you know, how happy I could be in that one smashed up car made me realize that, you know, it's all up here. It's not where we are physically, it's where we are mentally. And that, you know, there's no guarantee of tomorrow. And, you know, things like that happen. You really, really learn to appreciate every single day. And that's a week from that day, I started my motivational speaking. And uh, that was six years ago. I've done over 500 speeches since. So that, I mean, a horrible accident also, you know, a horrible thing in my life turned out to be sounds weird but a positive a good thing right because it's helped me uh, go out and appreciate every single day and try and help other people do the same uh, again so inspirational I love that kind of a story where it just turns it around and puts everything into perspective and so you speak mainly to youth I believe is that right I speak a lot to youth yeah. um, it's it's out there it's available I always also do corporate stuff and go into you know boardrooms people of all ages need motivation need a reason to keep going need to you know have tools to overcome obstacles and they love it just as much as the kids do so I mean yeah I'll go wherever they'll listen to me oh fantastic well I'll definitely be putting the links to how to get in touch with you and hire you for uh, for corporate teams and for training and for and for schools as well I was watching something that you did where you were speaking in front of a group of kids and one thing kind of struck me that you said and you said you know what most things in life don't go well most things really don't you know not, <laughs> most things are gonna go poorly so yeah. you know what you just got to keep rolling with the punches and almost like turn lemons into lemonade and yeah. turn you know, stumbling blocks into opportunities. And I really connected with that because I think too many of us, again, as soon as something is a roadblock or something that doesn't go the way we want it to, we just want to pack it in and say, well, it wasn't for me and I'm just going to go back to doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, life is full of roadblocks, right? And it's when we turn those into our stepping stones that we truly appreciate everything that happens around us. I mean, you know, there's lots of reasons to give up, lots of reasons to say I can't do that. And if you take those and you figure out why those are the reasons to motivate you, it's simply someone saying you can't do it should be enough reason to say, well, I can prove that person wrong. <laughs> right? Like I started healthy eating about, uh, uh, you know, off and on, but I stopped, just cut white sugar out of my life five months ago. And I remember when I first did it, it was around my kid's birthday. And I was like, you know, I'm not having any more cake anymore, any of that. And my kids are like, you're going to quit in two months. And every, you know, every time I want to quit, I'm like, no, I'm going to prove that wrong. So there's lots of, you know, spots like that where you can find your motivation to, to keep going and continue. And I've lost 30 pounds. Wow. Like, oh, Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Well done. Honestly, cutting yeah. white sugar is one of the one it's, it's just, have you seen the new movie, um, that sugar film? No. Got to check it out. Oh, so yeah. It's kind of like the super size me of sugar. The yeah. guy goes on just sort of a, a healthy sugar kick. It's not even yeah. cutting out cake and candy. I mean, that's that's kind of no brainers. Yeah. He yeah. is cutting out um, sort of healthy foods like yogurt and juice and just yeah. typical di you know things that are in most people's diet. And mm -hmm. so when he adds those things in because he's not norm you know used to eating that stuff, you can't believe the changes in his health. So I highly encourage people to check out that sugar film. Same well. with um, Fed Up is another one that Katie Couric actually backed and she uh that's another one that talks a lot about uh you know the demon that is sugar so uh, definitely worthwhile checking out so speaking of uh, of nutrition and health and that kind of thing because uh, certainly sarah talks food we do a lot of that uh, type of conversation what is the role of health and nutrition in your life and i know you're a personal trainer now so tell me how you got into that line of work after um you know the motivational speaking and after playing football and then what kind of uh, place nutrition and health has in your life well, the training started because uh, training for football, uh, people probably don't realize this in this hockey, you know, mad country that we live in, but the, the athletic development started in football, you know, 20 years ago and, you know, doing ladders, doing all sorts of things to make yourself a better athlete. It's hard to practice football because you're smashing into each other time. So the way to get better was always to be a better athlete. And sort of hockey sort of realized this probably 10, 15 years ago and they've sort of taken it over where we live anyways. So I had all these tools, all this information and, you know, ways of making myself a better athlete. So when my kids started playing sports, I was like, well, I'll help them in a little bit. And people saw the results and then it kind of just went from there, like zero marketing. It was all people coming to me and uh, training hockey teams and stuff like that. And then actually I've sort of geared back on that because the speaking is taking over. And, but you know, when you start working out super hard, you start to realize that, oh, it, you have to eat properly, right? So uh, when you eat properly, then you see the real results in your body 
but when you work out you know to be a better athlete you can see that in the sport as well so it's they, they kind of go together for sure i mean nutrition is so important and uh like i said five months ago i stopped eating just white sugar and juices and all that sort of stuff and man, i lost 30 pounds which is crazy and it makes me feel fantastic like you know i mean and i for me now i've switched over and i think about having some kind of cake or whatever like the, the, the fact that i used to be mm, delicious cake and then you know you rub your belly and have a nap now if i think about having cake well i still kind of think it's delicious but i also see you know it's going to make me feel horrible for like you know 15 20 minutes so i've sort of checked my mind and that's sort of the the decisions i make on a daily basis are based on on how uh, how well i feel i also notice that when I eat better, I think better. And uh, I've started doing stand-up comedy lately and you have to be on every single sentence, every single word. And you know, you need to, to have your brain firing correctly to do that. So everything I can do to make myself better at that, I do that too. And I, I think nutrition is definitely a big part in that. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I find such a brain fog when I do, you know, eat junk foods or sugar. And I do allow myself to have sort of a cheat day one day a week where I just kind of say, <laughs> if I want to have something bad, I will. And oftentimes those cheat days are kind of less and less because I just think, oh, I don't want to even feel so crappy. It's not even just for me 10 or 20 minutes after. It's like the whole next day I don't feel well. So, um, so good for you. I think that that's so powerful that really feeding your brain as well as your body is uh, is certainly what we're doing when we're eating food. So we may as well be putting good stuff into it. You know, that's the way I look at it for sure. Totally. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Tell us more about the stand-up comedy. How in the heck did you get involved in that? And uh, and where can we see you and what's going on with that? Tonight at Yuck Yucks. But uh, it started because I was doing, uh, yeah, seriously, uh, but uh, I was doing my speech. I, I have a 15 minute version of my speech that I do sometimes. And I was just doing it once for an adult crowd, actually. And uh, at the end of the night, someone came up to me and said, have you ever done stand-up comedy before? And I'm like, no. But, and they were like, well, you just did. And uh, so obviously, you know, I spoke to lots of people and I, I have lots of jokes and laughter in my, in my, talk, in my speeches and presentations that, uh, you know, sort of an mm, easy transition is not fair, but an uh, easier transition than other people. And I just went to like an open mic on uh, a Yuck Yucks in January, so nine months ago now. I entered their summer competition, did really well, made it to the finals, so that was good for my ego and also good for my stage time. So since then, I booked four or five, you know, pro shows, and uh, it's a lot of fun getting up there on stage. You know, maybe it's my replacement for sugar. I'm not sure, but it, it's okay. fantastic. It's a great high when you stand on the stage, make people laugh, and and it's very addictive. And so that's that, one of my goals now is to head in that direction. So that's a lot of fun too. Good for you! Wow, what a multifaceted guy you are. I mean, you are a an Ottawa firefighter as well. So, I mean, when I'm thinking about, you know, to the adrenaline rush, you've gotten it from football, from stand-up yeah. comedy, from motivational speaking, and certainly from fighting fires. Um, are you full-time working doing that? Is that is that what yeah. you do? That's I'm a professional firefighter. Yeah, that's sort of a, one of the things I also teach kids is and they're like, okay, you played pro football. But so what I tell them is how I, you know, learn to overcome obstacles and, and become a professional athlete, a professional football player. And so doing that, you know, everything after that became a little simpler. Like when I wanted to become a professional firefighter, which was one of my goals from a very young age as well, you know, I had the same process. I would just, you know, input all what I needed to become a firefighter and the fact that I'd already achieved something, you know, that people consider, you know, pretty special and playing in the NFL. And that sort of made everything easier. So when you chase your dreams and you achieve something, you work super hard, you know, people are like, oh, you always got to have a backup plan. But, you know, when that happens or it doesn't happen, everything else down the line becomes easier because you just get better at achieving goals and you know living your dreams and doing what you want and i would say you know a lot of people say success breeds success and i think that that's really a, a shining example in your life where it's just you know once you start getting used to achieving your goals it seems almost odd to not achieve them i would imagine yeah because you just don't give up till you do <laughs> right you realize the finish line is when it happens and then you set new goals so if you're like oh, i never achieved that that's because it hasn't happened yet right <laughs> So fantastic. So other than stand-up comedy and moving in that direction, have you got any other goals that you can share with us? Uh, well, what I do, and I like to spread that message, is uh, helping other people. And I do that through all the money I make through my presentations, school presentations, goes to Habitat for Humanity. And I go on trips around the world and uh, help build houses for people who, who are in need, families who, who just can't afford to, to do it. Last year, I went to Paraguay, built uh, two houses the year before, uh, Honduras. We went and built uh, five houses for you know needy families, 
This year I haven't made a plan yet, but uh, and I think it's really important that we do things to help people. And my, my theory, and you know, I mean, it's, first of all, it's an adventure to go to these countries, but we also go there and you, you do something for someone who really can't ever pay you back. I mean, they're there and they say thank you and the whole bit, but then you, they don't have that, uh, you know, you've done something for me. I don't have that power over them. So we go there, we do the good, we, you know, we pay the people there to help us and then we leave and, you know, that's, they can live their lives and they don't, you know, feel like they have to thank me every single day. I built your house for you, you know, <laughs> just makes me feel good. <laughs> I find I that so. really, I find that interesting because I know a lot of people will talk on Facebook. I see a lot of people saying that, you know, they'll treat someone to the, um, to coffee in the line behind them and never expect that. Thank you. And I know that's a tiny example, but I think it's that idea where it's just doing things where that person can never thank you. It's never going to be something where you get that pat on the back. It's just a nice thing to do for somebody else. That's, um, that's just, just nice. Yeah, and it feels great, like, right, you know, like, until you start doing things like that, you don't realize that that's actually what makes you feel really good, right? That's, I mean, people, oh, you're, you're being so generous, but at the same time, I'm actually doing it for myself. You know, it's a weird kind of thing. I'm actually doing it for other people, but it's because it makes me feel great. So, and I'm hoping to pass that message on. Imagine if we lived in a world where everyone just did things and didn't expect anything back. That's fantastic. And I'm hoping my kids uh, catch on to that too. That's one of my reasons for doing that. I imagine your kids are fairly involved in things. Are they in? I know you said one was playing football. Are all of them into playing football? And uh, no, the oldest plays hockey. The middle one plays football. And the little one plays uh, on his iPod all day long. <laughs> yeah. Well. yeah. Well, you know, third kid. <laughs> I love him too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You love them all the same. By what you've read in my Facebook, I love the little fella. <laughs> Well, Mark, I just want to say thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me today. I am inspired by you, by your story, by all of your accomplishments, and certainly by taking something like the, the death of your brother and turning that into something that has pushed you forward throughout your entire career and all of your life. I love the message of no matter how old we are, being able to just, you know, take any kind of small goal that we might be able to, to achieve and just going ahead and getting that and then having that success breeds success mentality to allow us to keep going and looking after our, our other dreams, our bigger dreams in our lives. So I just love the message for sure. Excellent. Thanks for helping me spread the message. That's excellent. And my wife painted this picture. Oh, I just got to say that. She's Very amazing. Good. Good, uh, yeah. <laughs> Does she sell her art anywhere in Ottawa? No, or she just, she like went to one of those paint the picture nights, I think. <laughs> Either, either she did that or she went out on the town and bought this on the way home. <laughs> either way, I'm good with it. Well, I love it. And I've actually heard a lot about those painting nights. So um, I should post something about that. I've, a lot of people are saying that they're really empowering because, again, people that don't feel like they are artists can yeah. go and, and, and paint one of these really cool things and come home and put it on the wall and feel really proud of themselves. So I think it's a really great service that's out there. I love it. It is great. It looks awesome. Yeah, it really is gorgeous for sure. Yeah, there we go. Well, again, thank you for coming to us under the stairs like Harry Potter. You are amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mark Hatfield. I certainly did. I love anyone who's got an inspirational story of, of hope, of, of tenacity, of relentless determination to go after their dreams. And this is certainly one of them. Mark, oh my gosh, that story when he tells that it was 10 years to the day that his brother put that dream in his heart to become a Miami Dolphin. And then Dan Marino walks over to him 10 years to the day and shakes his hand and says, welcome to the team. I mean, I just got goosebumps when he was telling that story. The story of his son and he getting into that car accident, that having you know potentially been the worst day of his life, but that, you know, there was happiness in that car because everything was gonna be okay. And it was like, you know what? You know, terrible things happen and these bad things happen, but you know, we're still gonna be okay. We're together and we're alive and make every day count. The concept that we have all got to be able to set some goals, even just little ones. I love that idea for kids. Set a little goal, get them to achieve these small little goals. I think that would have made a big difference in my own life. So I encourage any parents out there, little goals. Let's get those uh, kids being little mini achievers. I love it. And just going after your dreams relentlessly, just never letting stuff get in your way. You know, I, my goodness, he had all of these injuries and problems and issues that would come up. And I mean, probably weather and horrible conditions but he kept going after his dream. And once he got that one dream fulfilled, it was a lot easier to get other dreams fulfilled. And I just love that message too. It's a message of hope and of inspiration and of making your dreams come true. And I just hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I want you to love your life one bite at a time. 
All right, you gotta get out of here. I got an axe to grind. <laughs>